the next topic is usually referred to by the term folding right and i'm going to continue using that term over here right once again uh, a good reference for the material that i'm going to look at over here is uh, professor parhi's textbook vlsi digital signaling processing there are other places as well but you know i'm sort of following the treatment in parhi's book so the basic idea that we are looking at is hardware resource sharing right so this will also sort of tell you the idea of why the term folding right previously we looked at unfolding where what we did was we took a particular data flow graph and essentially created multiple copies of the actors in the graph and then connected them the idea was that by doing this you can construct a new graph which sort of gets closer to the best possible average iteration period and so on right by the way there was also one other question raised in the forum about unfolding and uh, you know iteration period i am i i did answer uh, you know i sort of responded to that on email but i think uh, i'll sort of get into that a little bit more later once we get into the problem of scheduling right where some of the actual benefits of unfolding will become a little bit more clear okay so anyway in keeping that in mind sort of the opposite of unfolding right in some at least logical sense would be the idea that i use limited amounts of hardware in order to implement a set of functions right but that's where the similarity ends and you need to be very careful about sort of drawing parallels between the two right because unfolding is something purely applied in the context of a data flow graph right it's a transformation on a graph whereas folding and hardware hardware resource sharing are relevant only in the context of an actual hardware implementation right that is to say when i actually have hardware uh, a fixed finite number of hardware units and i'm trying to use them in order to perform a larger number of computations the basic idea is how do i reuse the same hardware for multiple computations right an example of this was the first verilog assignment right you have a sequential multiplier so what is the same hardware it's one adder right and by putting it in a loop inside the verilog effectively what we created over there was we did the multiplication over a period of some you know some number of clock cycles right so effectively in other words the area of the multiplier would be much closer to the area of a single adder right and potentially you could have a reduction in area why am i saying potentially because there is overhead right there is after all there is uh, a uh, multiplexer there is a counter there are various other things that need to be added in for this kind of resource sharing to happen and you know the benefits have to outweigh the cost right which means that usually resource sharing is more effective when the resource that is being shared is a sort of relatively large resource right an example of that in let's say a communications receiver might be one fft block which is being used for multiple fft computations the granularity of the fft block is fairly large right i mean it, it by itself it consumes a certain amount of area and a large number of flip flops and logic and sort of if i can share that across multiple fft computations that would probably be good now clearly one other thing that we can sort of intuitively understand over here is because i am using the same hardware for multiple computations the system clock rate has to be higher than the rate at which samples are being processed right because i want to have multiple uh, operations running on the same hardware okay so i'm going to explain this in the context of an example right let's take a very simple example a simple adder chain i want to add three sequences of numbers a of n plus b of n plus c of n right so a is a stream of data b is a stream of data c is a stream of data add all of them together and sort of the trivial uh, example that i have over here right at the implementation would simply be add a and b together using one hardware adder take its result and go to and add it to c and finally generate and as a result you get y of n okay now another possible architecture that i'm going to draw for the same thing looks something like this right what i'm saying is i'm basically drawing one adder to start with right and saying that okay let me first feed it a and b what do i do with its output 
instead of straight away adding it to C, I'm going to go and put it into a register. Okay. And what do I do with the output of that register? That's not the result that I wanted. I will take the output of the register and feed it back into the adder. And when I do that, I'll also feed in C of L. Okay. Now clearly what I have drawn in black and what I have drawn in red cannot happen all at the same time. If I try doing that, then there's a problem, right? Because that will end up not really giving me the result that I want. Okay, and also my assumption is that I have only two input adders, not four input adders. Okay. So what does it actually mean? The circuit that I actually have in mind looks something closer to this, right? The A and the feedback from the register and the B and C are actually going through multiplexers. Okay. And those multiplexers are switching between zero and one. Right? So whenever the select signal is zero, A and B are fed into the adder. Whenever it is one, the register output and C are fed into the adder. Okay. Now I've just labeled the outputs of the multiplexers V1 and V2. The output of the adder as VO, right? not V0, VO. And the output of the register itself is X of N. Right? And finally, I've also labeled where Y of N is supposed to come. This is some kind of a switch, right, which should be turned on and off at some regular intervals. Now, why do I have all of this? Because I want to sort of go through the process and, you know, in time, step through this and understand how the this circuit behaves in practice. So let's look at a timeline, right? So basically what I've drawn over here is T, I've basically drawn different clock cycles in some way, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And of course, it goes on beyond that. So initially, when t is equal to 0, right, I'm assuming that the select signal to the multiplexers is also 0. Okay. And at that point, what will happen based on this diagram, what I have is A0 and B0 are going to be fed into as V1 and V2 respectively. Right. So V1 is A0, V2 is B0. Now, if you look at the circuit, what you will find is that it's a multiplexer followed by an adder. Both are combinational elements. So in the same clock cycle, VO will get the value A0 plus B0. Okay. Of course, there will be some delay. right? So the A0 and B0 itself are going to be delayed from, or rather the V1 and V2 values themselves are going to be delayed from the A0 and B0 slightly because of the multiplexer delay. The VO output is going to be further delayed. It's going to basically be, you know, a further one adder combinational delay is going to be there before the value actually comes out. But the point is within that clock cycle, the AO plus A0 plus B0 value has been computed. Okay. Now what happens in the next clock cycle? That A0 plus B0 is registered, right? And x takes the value a0 plus b0 okay so that is that first red arrow that i have drawn down uh, at the uh, bottom right so once i have that if i go look at the diagram i find that because of the multiplexer which has now had its select signal set to one the value of x is now going to go through the uh, go through to v1 Okay. So again, with some small combinational logic delay, what I'll find is that V1 gets the value A0 plus B0 from X. Okay. And V2 in turn gets the value C0 directly through the multiplexer from outside. Which means VO gets the value A0 plus B0 plus C0 right? after one adder delay. Okay, move further. That A0 plus B0 plus C0, which was at VO, right, now gets copied to the output, right, at the clock edge, it comes out on X as A0 plus B0 plus C0, right, and at that point is when I close this switch, right, and by closing the switch, what happens, I basically make it such that Y gets the value A0 plus B0 plus C0, okay? and while all that is happening, what do I do with V1 and V2? they get the new values a1 and b1 right? and vo gets the value a1 plus b1 move forward in time that a1 plus b1 gets copied into x in turn comes out as v1 
gets added to v2 and I get vo, a new value being computed there. I have not shown anything for y because at time instant 3, I open the switch. I don't keep it connected. So whatever is there on x will not come through at time instant 3. Depending on how y has been implemented, presumably that is also some kind of a flip-flop or register. It will just retain the last value that it had, which is a0 plus b0 plus c0. At time 4, once again a2, b2 have been applied as input. The a1 plus b1 plus c1 comes through to x and in turn I close the switch and get it out at y. Okay. And proceed like this, keep on. Okay. So this essentially what I have shown over here is this is how a single adder could be used in order to implement the a plus b as well as adding it then to c. Right? It was just one two input adder which I basically cascaded in this way and got it to add three values together. Okay. So now I just want to look at another alternative picture for this. Right, another diagram which does essentially the same thing. But if you look at it, what happens over here is this now has three phases, right? So the 0, 1, 2, right? I'm going to call the phases of the clock. Okay, so this is essentially a counter that goes 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. It has three different phases. During phase 0, A and B are selected through the multiplexer. They go to the adder, they get added and stored, uh, they get added. Okay, and at the next clock edge, they will be stored into the register. But if you look at the diagram, what happens in phase 1 is nothing. right? It's just basically I'm feeding zeros into the uh, multiplexer. Both of them go into the adder, come out as something which will get stored into that register. But what will happen is right? the value of A0 plus B0 which was stored into that register will by the time the zeros get stored into the first register, A0 plus B0 would have moved into the second register okay? and will then be ready to be added to C and basically be taken as the appropriate uh, in order to generate A plus B plus C. Okay? Now this cycle 1 right, essentially corresponds to a wasted cycle, there is no useful computation over here. And the other thing you will notice is that I also need one extra register so that the C of n gets added to the correct thing. Otherwise, I would have ended up adding C of n to something, you know, 0 or some other garbage value. Right? So, these two registers are now needed where only one was needed earlier. Overall, it seems like this is a terrible idea. Why would I do something of this sort? Right? And of course, as far as this particular design is concerned, the simple answer is yes, it is a terrible idea. Nobody would in their right mind would go and implement an adder for three values like this because it's just wasting time, nothing else, right? But such a situation can actually happen often in practice, not because you are intentionally sort of wasting time, but more because there are other computations or memory access or some other kind of data access, something else which is happening in some other part of the circuit, meaning that I actually need to wait and hold my data for some time before actually doing the computation. And an adder like this might suddenly find that during a given cycle, it has no work to do. Okay, So what do we do about that? We can define a term called the hardware utilization efficiency. Okay? So what does hardware utilization efficiency say? Intuitively, what we are saying is how many computations, I mean, if I have some X amount of hardware and I'm using it for some Y number of clock cycles, how many actual distinct computations could I have done within that time okay. versus how many are actually being done, right? Based on this, if I look at architecture one, what I mean by architecture one is where I had a single adder with the register and just a two phase clock, right? Going uh, 0, 1, 0, 1. The multiplexers just get the values 0 and 1 selecting between them. So that repetition period n is equal to 2 in this case. The number of adds that I need to do is again 2. In the first I do a plus b and next time I add c. Okay, Which means that if I look at it on every clock cycle, 
I'm using the adder to perform one addition exactly, right? Which means that the hardware utilization efficiency is essentially 100%. Okay. In contrast, in the second architecture where I clearly said that, you know, there is some wastage, n is equal to 3. The repetition period of the second architecture is 3 time units because the clock is, you know, the counter uh, input to the multiplexer goes 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2 and so on. Right? Whereas I still have only two additions to do, a plus b and then c. The 0 plus 0 is a irrelevant useless addition. Which means that the efficiency of my hardware has now dropped to 66%, two thirds. Okay. Now, as I said, this is an unrealistic example. A slightly more realistic example of this could be something, let's say that you are designing a Fourier transform module. Okay. And let's say it's a 32 point Fourier transform, right? And further assume that somehow you have come up with an architecture for this, which is implemented using one multiplier, one, one hardware corresponding to a multiplier, plus of course various other things, right? It will have some other adders, some uh, select signals, uh, possibly even like some memories for storage and so on. But as far as the multiplier is concerned, I'm able to do it with just one hardware multiplier. Okay. And that somehow I have come up with a latency for this computation of 500 clock cycles, right? Why 500? Somehow, something happened which, you know, required some reading data from memory, writing to memory, storing some arrays, uh, selecting some signals and so on, whatever else it is, right? And what that means is within 500 clock cycles, a single multiplier can actually perform 500 multiplications, right? But what I'm doing in practice is only n log n. Actually, it would be something else, right? It would probably be 3 into n log n or something of that sort. I'm assuming it is n log n, right? Let's say that uh, I'm just assume, assuming over here that the required number of multiplications is 32 into log of 32, which is 160. Okay. So if this was the case, then basically what I'm saying is that the hardware utilization efficiency would be 160 by 500 into 100%, which is 32%. Okay. So, hardware multipliers that are capable of performing 500 multiplications within 500 clock cycles are actually being used in order to perform only 160. Okay. So, this hardware utilization efficiency is a very important metric and something to always keep in mind whenever you are trying to design or implement hardware. Right? It's not just for hardware. Those of you who have done any GPU programming, are probably familiar with, you know, NVIDIA has their CUDA profiler uh, tools, which basically tell you about the occupancy of GPUs. It's exactly the same thing, right? The occupancy is once again saying how much time of the available time is the GPU actually doing useful work. Okay. You remember in the early part of the, uh, in one of the earlier lectures, we also went across this thing where I said that AlexNet, if you look at it, needs to perform something like 2 billion floating point operations, right? Uh, this, uh, you know, the NVIDIA uh, Titan uh, GPU could potentially within 5 milliseconds have done something like 50 billion operations, right? So what happened? It did only 2 billion as opposed to the 50 billion that it could have done. Right. Once again, effectively saying that the utilization efficiency, in other words, for the hardware, for there was very low. In fact, it was probably something like 4% or so. Okay. And this hardware utilization efficiency is always something that we would like to maximize, right? just like any other kind of, you know, which is why basically we are calling it an efficiency. Right? We always want to maximize the efficiency of usage of any uh, system that we are building. right? Why is it not always possible to get 100%? Because unlike the trivial sort of adder case that I showed earlier, in practice, any hardware actually involves multiple different kinds of operations. There could be some read and write accesses to memory. There could be some other things. There are some multiplications whose output in turn is being used by adders before I can then do the next multiplication and so on, right? So that is what is finally ending up taking 500 clock cycles, not just the multiplications alone. 
if I find that my utilization efficiency is low, then obviously I should be looking at some kind of modifications to my architecture to try and improve the efficiency. But in general, it is not always possible to get 